We are second week into our new series of Faithful and Faith Filled. We were last week introduced to a young hero who was probably around 14 years of age when his nation was held captive by a foreign ruler and he was then deported back to the, or to the nation of the conquering forces. And as um, someone who was one of the, the bright young potentials taken into this new nation, he was then taken into a school of the culture and the learning of that new uh, environment in Babylon. We're going to move on to chapter 2 today, and we're going to look at a Daniel that was probably around 17 years of age. It's important that we recognize that. I don't know if you can picture in your mind now someone who is 17, and imagine what it would be like for them to be removed from their family, removed from their homeland, surrounded by a very, very different culture, and put into circumstances that were incredibly challenging. And that's what we're going to see. We're going to see that something happened in the king, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the uh, victorious nation of Babylon, that Nebuchadnezzar had a very distressing dream. It was so distressing that he couldn't cope with just not knowing what this dream meant. And so he set a challenge that we're going to read about, and we see the consequences of that challenge, and we see God revealing himself through that. We're going to look at Daniel chapter 2 together, and we're going to read him a few verses at a time. And Daniel 2 verse 1 to 6 says this, In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, may the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will interpret it. As a fairly um, sensible thing to say, wasn't it? Come on, tell me your dream. In fact, we see, if you look back to the life of Joseph, that the Pharaoh of the time had a dream and he told Joseph what the dream was and Joseph interpreted the dream. And it was quite a, a good request for these people who were supposed to be some of the wisest and the most gifted around in that nation it was quite a sensible thing for him to say, well, King Nebuchadnezzar, tell us the dream and we will interpret it for you. But the king, verse 5, replied to the astrologers, this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Wow, what a challenge. Come on. I, now, in a, in a marriage relationship, there are times when my wife has a very specific thing in mind that she wants me to decide on, but she says to me, I don't mind what you choose. <laughs> but really, I know that's code for get it right. <laughs> or your tea will be burned to rubble that there's often times we're put in life where people have an impression or an idea of something that they're wanting, but they don't reveal what that is. But this was that at a whole new level. This was not you um, facing just a little bit of disenfranchisement from a close relationship. This was going to mean the end of your life and the end of the lives of all those who were around you. This seemed to be a really tall order. In fact, it was such a major thing for them that they said, who can do this? There is no one who can do this. Now, let me just clarify something, because I believe the scripture holds up to all sorts of question tests, because some of you may have noticed that it started off by saying, in the second year of King Nebuchadnezzar's reign, you remember the previous chapter talks about in the, the third year of the reign of the king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Um, and then Daniel, when he was captured and taken into captivity, studied for three years. 
So how is this now in Nebuchadnezzar's second year? Well, you know, for me, if I see that and think, well, if I can't believe that, if you can't get the chronology right, then how do I know everything else is correct? But I want you to know that all scripture is God breathed. And God doesn't make mistakes when he communicated via multiple authors that this book was to be written and have a unity throughout. You see, um, probably what this means is that in the first year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, it's often called his ascension year, that's the year he came to the throne, that that's when they took captive Judah and took the people into exile. And Daniel would have studied, began his study in exile in the year of ascension. And then in the first, so that was his first year, year of ascension. Then year one of Nebuchadnezzar's reign would have been Daniel's second year. And then the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign would have been Daniel's completion. This is when he got his degree. This is when he became, uh, you know, doc, uh, not doctored, he became um, degreed. What's the word I'm looking for? It's gone for me. He, he became... A what? A graduate. Of course it is. So he graduated at that point. So I just want to put that, because some of you might have just stumbled and thought, oh, that doesn't make sense. God's word always makes sense. And you can look at it with as much detail as you want. You can pick the Greek, you can pick the Hebrew, you can pick all the different languages, but it always makes sense if you look into it enough. Many people today have dreams, don't they? We go to other nations and there's often coined a phrase in the States about the American dream. We have a dream that in that nation that people, anybody can rise up and as long as your surname is Bush, you've got a good chance. <laughs> but anybody could potentially make their way into those political spheres. People have those dreams. We see in the culture of this nation, we have people who are crying in front of a TV camera saying, this is all I ever wanted. You know, I've spent all my life working towards this moment to this dream. And it's a little 10-year-old who's crying in front of the camera. This is the most important day of my life. This is my dream. I want to become famous. I want, my, I want the world to be singing my music. Many people have dreams. People dream of fame. They dream of fortune. Many people dream of security within their lives and they spend their lives working towards that. But I found that on many occasions that the things that people dream about and the things people work towards and the things people give their lives towards often brings them to a place of asking questions whether it was really worth it. Many dreams produce many questions. And we see here that Nebuchadnezzar, he was distressed by this dream. He couldn't work it out. And I see people throughout society that have got dreams about their lives, but it just doesn't make sense. They can't quite work it out in their lives. You know, one of the highest suicide rates um, among university students in the country, among some of the most reputed universities, where some of the wealthiest and the richest and the cleverest go. You know, ed education and money doesn't answer the deeper questions of people's lives. They may have a dream, but they've got many questions. That there are many people who have... Um, they've married that person of their dreams and their choice and then later down the line they just find that there is still an emptiness within their life and they begin to make stupid decisions in their life they begin to blow it all yeah. there are many people whose dreams produce questions that, and they're just crying out what's the answer I've shared with some of you, some of you before I had the opportunity a number of years ago to go on a holiday and uh, we won the holiday and it was a very w rich and wealthy person that, had, um, th that uh, was in charge of this whole process and we uh, were his personal guests for 10 days of this holiday in Namibia on safari and every night we would go out for a meal with him and one of his friends who was a, a scientist and they would grill me about my faith night after night and they would grill Nita about her faith night after night and they would ask things that were trying to disprove what it was that we believed and we had a great time with them and we got on really well with them but on the very very last night after 10 days of constant challenge to our faith on the 10th day on the last evening of the holiday he had had a little bit too much to drink and he came up to me and he said Mark he said if I if I'm honest with you I've had dreams in my life that confirm what you believe. And I thought, why didn't you tell me that 10 days ago? 
And I find that there are so many things going on in people's lives about dreams and about visions. And there are people in communities all over the world. Some of you may have seen some videos online of some people in ISIS who have had dreams and visions of Jesus and given their lives to him. There are people in nations of the world who are in the middle of the night. They are experiencing dream, dreams of Jesus coming to them and revealing himself. And they're giving their lives to Christ even though it costs them everything. We live in a nation that has many dreams. Many of them are false dreams that continue to raise questions. And some of them about Jesus are dreams that brings, bring answers. But you see, many of these questions and frustrations that come They have left many people distressed, just like Nebuchadnezzar, and they're longing for understanding, to make sense of what their life is all about. They're longing for that question mark to be turned into a resolution and an answer. Jesus, when he looked out over the people, when he was walking the face of the earth, he he looked around and with great compassion, he said, they are like sheep without a shepherd. They wander, they eat, They go about their business, but there's no direction. There's no answers to their life. And Jesus came to bring answers. And the church is to be a place that brings answers, brings resolution. I know there are some ministries in the world that will go onto the streets. They will go into some of the fairs that take place. And they will set up a table and say, dreams answered here, dreams interpreted here. And people will go up and will share their dreams And they will begin to interpret under the work of the Holy Spirit to begin to help them understand what the dreams are that are happening within their lives. But I don't know know many that say, come to us and we'll tell you what you've been dreaming and we'll interpret it for you also. And I certainly don't know many that the consequences of failing to do so are any more than a little bit of egg on their face rather than them and all their colleagues and their homes and their families being burned to rubble. That was the precious stakes that were here. Verse 10, let's look at this. The astrologers answered the king, there is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. They were absolutely right. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods. And they do not live among humans. See, what a a level of frustration would have been experienced here. And we we read that this, this made the king, in verse 12, so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. This was a man not to be messed with. Execute them all. See, he he had probably given lots into their lives. He had invested a lot of training. He gave them a lot of privileges. And a lot of these people were yes people. They would pander to the requirements of the king. And they said, if you show us the dream, tell us the dream, we'll make up an interpretation for you. And the king saw straight through it. The king saw straight through their lack of integrity and authenticity. You know, society looks at the church and sees right through our lack of authenticity and integrity. Do you realize one of the biggest objections that the world have against the church is that we say one thing and live another? Do you know in London, there's a church that started off a few years ago called the Atheist Church. They meet every Sunday in a big building. They grow in. They maybe get about four or 500 people on a Sunday. And it's like church, but without God. And there was an interesting article a few months ago where the leader of this atheist church went and visited some Christian churches. And he was interviewed about his experience. He said that he loved it. He thought it was great. And he has taken a lot of ideas of things that they do within those Christian churches, and he's going to deploy them into his atheist church. And things about how they greet, symbolism that they have, songs that tap into certain emotions. We're going to copy that, he said. We'll just take the God bit out. And that's what he's been doing. A friend of mine, he met with him a few weeks ago, and he had a coffee with him. And this leader of the atheist church said, do you know what I would love? I'd love to go around and preach in churches. 
I would love to have an opportunity to put a tour on in churches. My friend intrigued said, what would you say? You don't believe in God. He said, you know what I would say to them? I would say, if I was a Christian, I wouldn't, I wouldn't live like you live. Because if what you believe is really true, then I, I think you would be living differently. This was an atheist. He wants to travel around the churches and challenge the church about their faith, about their authenticity, about their transparency, about their integrity. We live in a world that needs the declared truth of God's word, but we need to live as God's people in a way that demonstrates it whether we use words or not. That's why so powerful this week, many of you would have seen those dark and tragic events unfold in Charlestown in the States. Have you seen some of the family's response this week? They've talked about forgiveness. They've talked about holding no hatred towards the person who has been, um, who has been arrested. They have poured out an authenticity about their faith that we look on and say, how do they manage to do that? Well, they manage to do it because the gospel is real, because God's word is alive, because his spirit is present, and he brings about change. Yes, he does. People won't, they won't faff around with a church that pretends to interpret what's going on in the world. We need to know Verse 13, so the decree was issued to put the wise men to death and the men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to be put to death also because they were among those number. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him. 17-year-old Daniel spoke to the, the commander of the king's guard and he spoke with wisdom and tact. God grant us wisdom. You know, the scriptures say in Proverbs that wisdom is crying out on the street corners looking for people who will adopt it, looking for people who will take wisdom into their home to give it the best room in their life and to say, let the wisdom of God be mine. With wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went in to the king and asked for time. 17-year-old Daniel went into the king and said, we need some more time. <laughs> there needs to be a courage on the church. We need to be able to be unintimidated by anything that will set itself up in opposition to God. He asked for time so that he may interpret the dream for him. <laughs> then Daniel returned to his house, explained the matter to his friends. I wonder what they thought about his explanation. And he urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And during the night... The mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. Amazing. 17-year-old Daniel steps out to see the king and says, my God. Except he didn't say that, did he? He said, give us some time. And then he went to his God. We saw last week how society that they were brought exiled into, tried to change their name, tried to take away their God. And this small group of people were probably among the remnant of the true followers of Yahweh, of God. And if the king had exterminated this remnant, then the promise of Abraham's seed being as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the earth would have died at that moment. Because this was the remnant of those who really, really were true followers of the Lord. So this was a moment where God's promise to Abraham was under the spotlight. This was a moment of destiny for Daniel. 
And yet he wasn't taken to Christian conferences on an annual basis, encouraging his faith. He wasn't going to church on a week-in, week-out basis. He wasn't part of a life group. He wasn't surrounded by podcasts. He didn't have Christian TV in his home. He was living in a foreign land. He was surrounded by a foreign language. He was surrounded by the opponents of God. He was working with astrologers and people who were conjuring up things in other spirits. And yet this bold man full of the wisdom of God said, we need some more time. Stepped out of the crowd, shared his burden with fellow believers, and then he did what you and I need to do. We need to pray. Prayer, as we looked at last week, has been really misunderstood by us. Prayer is the incredible invitation of the king of the universe to step into the room with him and to converse. And we have turned it into writing requests on a bit of paper and lobbing it in the air and hoping that someone will catch it. We think prayer is like message in a bottle. I throw it in the ocean and hopefully it'll land on the shores of heaven sometime and God may answer it. That is not prayer. That's a message in a bottle. Prayer is direct dial access to the Almighty. The astrologers and the magicians said, no human can do this. Only the gods. Well, they were wrong. Only God. But they said, the gods don't live on earth. Who? But God does. He lives in you. He lives in me. And there are so many circumstances within our lives. We try everything first. Under the threat of this, we may think about running away. We may think about hiding. We may bury some possessions. We might smuggle someone out. We'll try all the options. And if they fail, in our absolute desperation, we may say, okay, God, would you help? Daniel did none of those things. He went to who he knew was the true source of hope. And he threw himself and his housemates, they threw themselves before the mercy of God and God answered. Let's skip forward to verse 31. It says, Your majesty looked. This was Daniel now going to King Nebuchadnezzar and saying, I've got it. I've got the answer. Verse 31. Your majesty looked. And there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. I can imagine Nebuchadnezzar at this point leaning forward in his seat. Going, Do you know, that's just what I saw. I wonder what began to come over him at that moment. He had been sleepless. He had been distressed. He had been plagued by this dream that he privately held and now a 17 year old with acne on his face I'm guessing stood before him and began to tell him the head of the statue was made of pure gold its chest and his arms of silver its belly and thighs of bronze I wonder if this is where the Olympics started their gold, silver and bronze its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them 
Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain that filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. I wonder if Nebuchadnezzar at this moment, just tears rolling down his cheeks, this has been something that had been enormously dominated in his mind. Daniel says, your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven, notice it was two small Ks in king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all of mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky, wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. Interest in the wisdom of Daniel here. You are all powerful, Daniel. You are all powerful, Nebuchadnezzar. But the power that you have has been given you by another. Narcissistic, megalomaniac, despotic leaders think it's theirs. It's not. There is no one in this world who has authority but by God allowing it. Verse 39. After you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet, the toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron. So this will be a divided kingdom, yet it will have some strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the meantime, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God... The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. Just while we look at this, you're going to see a video behind of just what that vision may have looked like. Artistic impression. We see the gold head. This gold head was, as Daniel said, Nebuchadnezzar's reign. This was the, the, this was the, 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 the nation of Babylon. This was the Babylonian empire that ruled the earth. It was phenomenal and strong and powerful and rich. And in fact, all the others that were going to follow it were really um, not as significant or as strong in many ways. This was a golden empire of worldwide domination. And they were united. They ruled the entire earth. And next, we see a silver chest and arms. This was symbolic of the nation that was going to conquer the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians. And this nation, this empire that built up was always not as significant as the Babylonians. This nation, um, while it started off united, it never really enjoyed that glory of Babylon. It's a divided kingdom. And then we read of the Greek empire that conquered the Medo-Persians. Originally, it was united. You might have heard the name Alexander the Great. Well, he really was um, probably the greatest heyday of the Greek Empire. They conquered the Medo-Persians, and there was a time of unity, but then that split into two after Alexander the Great's reign. Interesting that the bronze belly and thigh leads into two legs and it started off united and then it broke into two kingdoms. But then the iron, the clay, legs and the feet, the Romans. Do you know, 
the Romans had two aspects to them. There was the East Empire and the West Empire. Two legs. Iron. The Romans were strong, militarily powerful, brutal. Do you know at the end of the Roman Empire, they split into how many kingdoms? Ten. Ten toes. Do you know the phenomenal thing about this? This was written in the 6th century BC. And it tells of the story of kingdoms leading up to the birth of Jesus. Hundreds of years in advance. In fact, this is so accurate that people could not believe that in, there are commentators, Bible commentators today, that dispute that this could have been written in the 6th century BC because it is so phenomenally accurate. Many of them will say that this couldn't have been written till the 2nd century BC until there would have been an understanding of the Roman Empire coming in to that. But we'll look at that in a moment. But the first thing I want to say is God's word is true. And Daniel communicated not his thoughts, not his impression, but he communicated the very words that God had given him. One of the greatest things that we can do within this church is to be a church that communicates the Word of God. God's Word never lies. His promises never fail. His truth will never return to Him void. He always accomplishes that which He purposes. And if He, hundreds of years in advance, can talk about nations of the world, some that didn't even exist at the time of this word coming out of the mouth of 17-year-old Daniel, then there's no, no telling what truth can be accomplished through the power of his word within our lives. God's word is true. The beginning of creation, the Godhead said, let there be light, and there was light. Jesus came with words of truth. He spoke light into people's circumstances. He spoke at the woman of the well of Samaria and he revealed to a woman who was ostracized and was in at the well at the height of the day's heat when no one else was around because her life was full of shame. And Jesus spoke hope and light because the word of God is powerful. It's a two-edged sword that just can speak right into our circumstance and our situation. God's word is true. The detail is true. But secondly, everything is in God's hands. Back to that disputed time of authorship of this. People making these conclusions that this is just too incredible to believe that this could have been written so far in advance. That's dispelled. You go to Mark 13, verse 14. And we read Jesus quoting from a later chapter in the book of Daniel. And he says, as Daniel said, as Daniel declared, Jesus quoted Daniel as the author of this book. Let me just add this into you. The universe is not out of control right now. There may be CFC gases, there may be banking crisis, there may be despots, there may be rulers of this world, there may be ISIS, there may be all sorts of atrocities, there may be all sorts of breaking of human rights, but the universe is not out of control. Because God is the king of kings, the ruler of rulers, Nothing surprises him. Nothing side-foots him. Nothing confuses him. He is supreme. He is sovereign. God cannot be sovereign if he is not in control. The universe is not out of control. Think about this. 
If God can direct the nations and thrones of the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans, if he can decide which of those will be united and divided, think about what it takes at a macro level in order to see those things come about. Answer me this, if he can do that, surely he can work in your life. Surely he's bigger than your circumstance. Surely he's greater than the mess that you're in right now. Surely if he can take a 17-year-old boy living in a foreign land who has been indoctrinated by the culture of that society, this will be like one of our young people taken across and enslaved by ISIS and indoctrinated by their teachings and for them going to see the ruler and standing before them and saying, God says this. If God can do that, then there's no telling what he can do through a bunch of people serving him in Exeter, Plymouth and Torquay. There's no saying what he can do through the church of this nation or the nations of the world. There's no saying what he can do through you in your workplace. And you say, my workplace is such a heathen place. You know, it's such a difficult environment. My university is such a difficult place. My neighborhood is such a difficult place. Look at Daniel. Look at Daniel. Look at how much more experience and support and help you have today. Look at what he had. See, we can go to conferences, we can read books, we can go to church services, we can be prayed for. But the reality is, we need to be a people that throw ourselves before the face of God and say, God, help me to interpret the world around me. Help me to minister to other people who are in distress. And God can do that. If he can move nations, he can move through you. And we always begin to think about things on an intellectual level. We always think evangelism is about winning an argument. It's not about winning an argument. It's about sharing a reality. Sharing a truth. Sharing a joy. Sharing an experience. And it's even bigger than that. Finney, a few hundred years ago, America, walks into an office, into a factory. The presence of God is so powerful. Without him saying anything, people begin to cry out to a God that they never met. What would it take for your workplace, your home, your prodigals? What would it take It will take not you winning an argument. It will take not you convincing them that your truth is better than their understanding. It will take them encountering Jesus. You know, the moment the prodigal son knew that he was safe was not the moment he was intellectualizing this in his mind. It was the moment he experienced the hug of the father. Society needs to experience the hug of the Father. On this day that we celebrate in this culture, this country and some other countries across the world, a Father's Day, I think our Heavenly Father is weeping for those who are estranged from Him. He's looking for their return. And He's looking for Daniel's. Everything is in God's hand. And I'm going to finish with this. Thirdly, there's absolutely no reason for Christians to be discouraged. Maybe if I walked around with a mic right now and said, do you think that's true? 
we might all have some stories to share of circumstances that we are finding ourselves in the middle of or we have been in that we may say, I think that's a pretty good reason to be discouraged, Mark. We all have those stories. But you see, what we read is that a rock came out of nowhere and it struck the feet. The Roman Empire, 10 divisions, Jesus, the cornerstone, the rock that the builders rejected, that they, that they, they denied, comes onto the scene. And he doesn't set up a nation. He doesn't set up a part of the world that gathers a revolutionary group of people and builds a protective wall and says, everybody come here. It's not a geographical kingdom. But it's a kingdom that we read. Turns, the rock turns into a mountain. And the mountain covers the earth. I believe with all my heart that when Jesus said he will build his church, he will absolutely build his church. That when statisticians say that if the church carries on at its current rate, it may be extinct by the year 2050 or whatever, I look at it and I smile. And I say, no statistician knows better than God. When he says that there will be a stone, a rock that will smash these kingdoms, he was absolutely right. And when he says that that stone will become a mountain that will cover the face of the earth, he is absolutely right. And there's a glory coming on the church, on the world, that I believe will far outstrip anything the nations of the world have ever seen before. I believe that what God is doing, what he's up to, is greater than you and I can dream or imagine. I believe that God has invited us to be a part of that. He invites us to join with him that his glory will be revealed. Let his glory be seen. Let his glory be manifest. His kingdom will never pass away. His kingdom breaks every barrier, whether they be racial, generational, national, it breaks all of those boundaries. His kingdom rules in hearts, not in castles. His kingdom has an eternal king that will never be dethroned. His kingdom, there is nothing that can stop its growth. It's a mountain that fills the earth. We read that the exile, Daniel, the young boy and his friends that had been so faithful in difficult circumstances and they had been so faith-filled against the odds that God promoted them. God knew this all the time. Daniel was elevated to become one of the key leaders in that foreign land. And in a day where apparently Christianity is not very politically correct, where it feels like we're in a distant land right now, it feels like we've arrived in a place that is opposed to the purposes and the truth of God. Yet I believe God will elevate his church and his glory will be seen in Jesus' name. Amen.